exactly, exactly. <laughs> Um, but we've got lots of folks um, on the call today who are excited to talk to you. Um, our parents have put a ton of work uh, into putting together their statements of beliefs on DC schools recovery. Um, and they're excited to ask uh, you questions about your about their priorities today. Um, so without yeah. further ado uh, from me, I will kick it over um, to our meeting chair, Sharon, uh, to take, she will be leading the meeting today and Sharon, take it away. Thank you, Carrie. How are you all? How you doing? Good morning. Good. I'm doing well. Thank you. Am, um, I, un, am, I, am I unmuted? <laughs> yes, sir, you are. We can hear you very okay. clearly. Thank okay. You. All right. So I just want to say welcome to everyone to DC's um, Parent Voice and Choice Week, our first virtual um, DC Parent Voice and Choice Week. I'm welcoming all of our parents and our policymakers. Um, my name is Sharon Culver. I am a citywide board member, um, a Ward 7 PLE board member, um, and I have a number of children, seven in total, um, and uh, two of them attend Ann Beers Elementary School, uh, pre-K three and first grade, and I also have a young king who attends Ron Brown high school. Um, and so as um, meeting chair, I will be facilitating today's conversation to ensure that all parent question askers are able to have their voices heard, um, monitoring us for time so that we can make sure that we're staying on track. Um, and I'm just excited to be back at the table um, with my fellow parents and of course you as well, Council Member Gray. Thank um, you. I know that some families, um, some parents have already um, put into the chat um, their names and their wards of residence. Um, and so that council member Gray knows who is here today um, because as parents and guardians of our city's children, you are absolutely um, a critical voice in education policy. So I'm excited to be here with you today and um, what will hopefully be the first of many opportunities this year for you to share your voice with council member Gray. Um, and before we get started um, with our parent questions, um, council member Gray, do you have any um, opening remarks that you'd like to share with us. Well, I apologize, first of all, for being a little late uh, to get involved with this, and I appreciate the uh, patience of everybody to, uh, you know, to now join in, uh, and I'm looking forward to the, uh, the dialogue. Uh, I've always uh, enjoyed coming to pay, uh, <clears throat> and this is a little bit different uh, this year, uh, to say the least, um, but you know what? We're all here, and we're all uh, working hard to try to spend as much time as we can uh, focusing on our uh, kids and, uh, you know, and, and trying to get our kids as quickly as we possibly can back into school. Um, I think all of us agree, frankly, that um, having our kids in school, uh, sure, there's, there's no question that virtual learning is an important uh, opportunity experience for uh, our young people, um, but there really is no substitute for it being in a classroom as long as we can do that as safely uh, as we possibly can, uh, which of course is our, our biggest goal. I have spent uh, some time uh, visiting some of the schools um, and we'll be spending some time in the next few days uh, visiting some of the schools, you know, like Woodson and uh, Kelly Miller, uh, some of the, the secondary schools uh, to see, make sure they're ready to be able to receive our kids uh, back in school and that our kids are excited about doing that. We, we hope that this is a, a good experience also for our teachers, um, you know, who have to cope with the, uh, you know, with the conditions uh, in our schools at this point, uh, meaning the physical conditions. Uh, and we hope that this is a, a good experience. I think around the country, lots of, lots of areas, lots of school cities, uh, lots of counties are having the kinds of challenges that we've experienced, we are experiencing here in the, uh, in the District of Columbia. <clears throat> and I look forward to once again, as I've done in the past, and I will look forward to doing it this year as well, um, working with our, you know, our parents. Uh, parents are the heart uh, of this effort. And we know that parents are the folks who ultimately hold accountable, myself and others uh, who deeply care uh, about what happens to our children uh, in the learning experiences that they hopefully are having. Um, I wanna also thank Maya uh, for the great work she's done uh, over the years. Uh, she called me a few minutes ago just to make sure that I was gonna be joining the call. And uh, I was finishing two other calls. <laughs> it's, been a, it's been an interesting day already. So I wanted to make sure I you know, spent some time with uh, Pave though and parents and the, the folks who are deeply engaged uh, with, uh, you know, with our children. Um, I think most of you know 
uh, my background. I mean, I've spent a lot of time with uh, education and um, I appreciate the continuous efforts uh, of PAVE. I have been a huge supporter, as you know, of uh, early childhood education and will continue to be. Uh, you know, if we get it right there, uh, our kids will do very well. And if we don't get it right there, it's going to make a challenging experience for our children in ways that they should not have to uh, experience. So uh, again, um, I think most of you know that <clears throat> I've been a, a, a leading advocate for our B3, uh, birth to three uh, services and programs uh, as well. And um, we hope that uh, we will be able to continue to expand uh, the resources of being devoted to B3. Uh, we've got lots of advocates out there who care about this and uh, I'm among those, okay? Um, I've, uh, again, spent a great deal of my time uh, working on early childhood education and we'll work as hard as I possibly can to be able to get additional resources, dollars, uh, for uh, B3. Uh, I think everybody knows that we're facing some real serious financial challenges uh, in the city, and uh, we're not going to let that stymie us, though. Uh, we're going to work as hard as we can uh, to try to bring the resources that our children need uh, to bear. Um, we got uh, $15 million to get the uh, Birth to Three program uh, started. Uh, I was happy to be able to do that, but there's a lot more money that's needed. Uh, I won't say that's a drop in the bucket, but it, it is a start. Uh, it's the kind of start that we've needed. And uh, frankly, having the support of PAVE, um, and we hope that you will support us uh, to try to get additional dollars available uh, to, you know, to our children, put it that way. Um, maybe great. want for me to transition uh, off to those who have questions. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. We really appreciate that, um, those remarks that you gave us. And we certainly do have um, a good number of questions that we want to share with you this morning. Um, mm -hmm. And so um, our first question, um, we're going, I'm going to hand over to um, Marcia Huff. She is a Ward 7 PLE board member. Um, and she has children at Two Rivers PCS. And she's going to be asking a question um, about something that you just mentioned, um, equitable school funding. Marcia. Mm -hmm. Good morning, Councilman Gray, and thank you for taking time. Can you can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, perfect. It, it was a little glitchy. I was getting nervous. Um, I'm Marcia Huff, and I'm a Ward Seven resident, and I'm a mom of two children, and I also work for a DC nonprofit that works with and advocates for foster youth as well as youth experiencing homelessness. It's the Young Women's Project. We've worked with you a lot over the past years. Sure. Our, our kids deserve to attend adequately funded public schools where their needs are being met, yet the uniform per student funding formula is failing to keep up with the rising cost of education and is particularly underserving students who are identified at identified at at risk as the at risk weight is currently set at $2,551 per student, which is a gap of about $1,500 per student from what's needed. Now, even the increases last year and the per student funding formula were inadequate considering inflation and the COVID-19 crisis. Parent leaders such as myself are prepared to partner with you to ensure that the at-risk weight and base per pupil funding is increased to meet the needs of our children and families across our city. Another thing that I'm really passionate about is that we treat our at-risk students the same, whether they fall into the cat different categories. You know, a young person who is experiencing homelessness um, and fighting for the basics, such as having a food, clothing, getting to school, laundry, technology, etc., is very different from a young person who's in our DC foster care system that has significant investment, at least on paper. Um, how can we have accountability and transparency to ensure that the at-risk funding is reaching the students who really need it and that the funds are used to meet their particular needs? Well, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, it's so long, but <laughs> that's okay. Um, I, I would say, and not, not, not to repeat back to you all what you already know, uh, I think by PAVE, continuing to do what it has done year in and year out uh, is the way to do that. 
Uh, and also, frankly, those who are responsible for getting resources to us, uh, hold, holding them accountable also. I think, I think virtually everybody has to know what happened to the District of Columbia uh, when the, the money came along last year for the CARES funding. Um, we should have gotten substantially more uh, than what we got, and we didn't. Uh, I'm hopeful now that we have a new administration, a new federal administration uh, with uh, Biden and Harris uh, leading the, uh, the, the, uh, the team, uh, that we will get a fair allocation of resources uh, that we did not get uh, when, was, when this was done uh, a number of months ago. So I'm asking PAVE if you all would join me and my colleagues to help continue make, to make the case for why uh, you know, additional resources are needed and how those resources uh, will be used. Uh, making sure that at-risk dollars get to where they're supposed to get to is hugely important. Uh, and uh, I will continue to work to fight the fight. Uh, to try to get those dollars where they are. Um, and I'm hopeful too that, you know, with the new members uh, that we have uh, on board, we have, uh, of course, a new member uh, in, board, um, in board four and, and the previous member too. Uh, Brandon Todd was a great education uh, supporter. Uh, we also have um, Christa, Christine Henderson, who is now, uh, who used to work with uh, David Grasso and worked closely with us uh, as well. She's now uh, a council member. And we got Brooke Pinto, who I know is deeply committed uh, to, uh, to our children um, who have at-risk uh, needs, who have other uh, needs that have to be met. So I would ask you all to make sure, you know, who all the people are that should be uh, weighing in uh, on this issue and work with us to try to bring to bear the, um, you know, the support that they should be working to uh, help make it happen. Um, it's gonna take that kind of commitment and that kind of support and that kind of engagement, I think, to get us where we wanna get to. And I think you all know where that is. Uh, and I'll be working hard to do that myself. All right, thank you. Thank you. And, and just so you're, you're real, you also believe that it should be fully funded at 1500 and we can count on you to you know, be right beside us in the fight to really bring in that number and prioritizing that. I know we have a lot of needs, but we just want no, to make sure right. that's yeah. at the top of the priority. I would say and ask Maya and ask some of the other parents who've been involved with PAVE, ask if I've been someone you could count on uh, to um, to support uh, the needs. We, we haven't always had the money uh, that we needed to be able to make things happen, uh, especially consonant with uh, you know, what PAVE has wanted to do. Uh, I've been more than happy to be able to, to fight the fight uh, to get additional dollars. We haven't always gotten as much as we wanted to, but I'm going to continue to fight this year uh, to make that happen. So um, I would say you guys, you guys are going to have an agenda, uh, you know, putting that together. And I hope that you will share that with all the other members uh, of the council. And um, I think you're going to find, I mean, I, they can speak for themselves, but uh, I, I think you're going to find a lot of support for supporting education um, at an even greater extent than what we've done uh, in the past. Um, and I know you guys will hold us accountable. I know you will keep our feet to the fire uh, to try to make that happen. Thank you for that question, Marcia and Councilmember Gray. You are absolutely right. We will do um, everything that we can do to continue to hold you all accountable um, for making sure that our children get exactly what it is that they need. Um, absolutely. We're going to um, move to our next um, parent member who has a question, um, Randy Grant, um, our another Ward 7 PLE board member, um, who is going to ask about one of our um, priorities for this year, um, which is mental health supports. Randy. Mental health support? Yes. <laughs> I always uh, practice. Sorry about the muted, but good morning. Good morning, <laughs> how are you? <laughs> good, glad you're here with us, Mr. Gray. I have seen you in many capacities and I love that you are for education. With that said, again, my name is Randy Grant. I've been in DC over 30 years. Um, 
I have two children, 10 years uh, in Ward 7. I have two children. They attended Washington Latin. My daughter uh, just recently graduated from GW on a full ride scholarship. My youngest, mm -hmm. who I will use. Well, oh. Yes, it is. And she's a great <laughs> student too. Um, but my story begins with my youngest daughter, who at 11 years old was attacked on her way home from school by two teens. Beat, they beat and robbed her um, right at the corner of Hillside Road and Chaplin Street Southeast mm -hmm. um, as she got off the U8 bus. She was a block away from home. This incident spun her into the in inability to go to school, um, a CFS visit and suicide attempt, which landed mm -hmm. her in the Psychiatric Institute of Washington. Um, I might cry, excuse me. She was yeah, diagnosed okay. with- it's all right. She was diagnosed with PSD, PTSD, agoraphobia, anxiety, and depression. When you consider the impact of adverse childhood experience known as ACE, the impact of trauma on the brain, we can all agree that the need for quality professional mental health services is at an all time high. In 2018, I also worked at the school where 11 year old committed suicide. So understand, I'm speaking from the front line, and this is, you know, I'm really passionate about that. Um, which which school was that uh, that the child? Uh, uh, seed, seed. Yeah, I, I remember the incident. I remember that. Yeah. Right, right. Um, you know, like many parents, we're left out, shamed, and blamed about the needs of our children due to limited amount of mental health services, right? And it's a complicated process, even getting first understanding the diagnosis of your child, getting your job, child diagnosed, having the, someone at the school do it, you get caught up in a, a you know, just a ridiculous amount of circles. Um, just for me personally, in eight years, I have, was not able to get adequate mental health services for my daughter. We know that the mental health and wellness is important for our children to learn because on a trauma brain, they can't learn. So when I saw that they cut $9 million out of the, the, the budget, right? When you consider that it was actually 4 million, but it would have been matched, I was mortified. You know, right now, you know, with the pandemic, we're still dealing with children with gender identity issues, sex exploitation, poverty, crime, violence, you know, the whole gamut. So why that wasn't pulled up and, and dealt with is concerning to me. I can only imagine with the pandemic and the social distancing what's happening with our children's mental health. We have one in 10 children that have mental health challenges that are severe enough to impair function at home, school, and in the community. And I'm telling you firsthand, that is the absolute truth. It's mortifying. Over 50% of our students ages 14 and older with emotional and behavioral disabilities drop out of high school, right? When you consider the, the general impact of poverty on children and dropping out of school, that, that creates and continues cycles of homelessness -ness and poverty, et cetera. Um, and so my question, you know, with all that information, what are we going to do to make it a, a greater priority than it has been? How are we going to get that $4 million back and hold the federal government accountable to match those, that funding? And what, what can we do, I'm asking? Well, first of all, uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think those who know me uh, know that I have, I've been um, an unwavering advocate uh, for uh, school-based mental health uh, services. In fact, when I came back uh, to the council, because I guess you know, my, hopefully you know my background. I was a council member, then I became the chair of the council, then I became the mayor of the District of Columbia. Uh, I was out uh, for a while, then I came back. And one of the things that I did when I came back was to devote uh, full-time and attention uh, to the school-based mental health uh, program. In fact, I was really pleased to be able to work closely with uh, David Grasso, uh, who was a colleague uh, on the council at the time. Um, we had somebody who was running the Department of Behavioral Health, who neither of us felt was really 
devoted uh, as one should be uh, to the uh, school-based mental health uh, program. Um, I had lots of uh, clinicians uh, from the schools who came around and visited with me. Uh, and I think there were lots of uh, members of PAVE who came out, who came out and met with me uh, also. And I made the commitment uh, when I got back that we were gonna do as much as we possibly could, that we were gonna put together a real plan for school-based uh, mental health uh, services. And we did that. And we got it adopted uh, by the council and adopted by the uh, administration. Um, we got some additional money uh, at that stage uh, to increase uh, what we had available uh, to folks. And was it enough? Of course not, it, it is not. And I'm asking you all to please continue to advocate for the dollars that we need. Uh, I mentioned uh, earlier that the district should have gotten more money uh, than what we got uh, from the federal government uh, when this COVID uh, process started uh, last spring, been almost a year now. Uh, since it started, and we're, <clears throat> we're all still trying to adapt uh, to that. Uh, but in the course of it, we have devoted uh, as much attention and time and resources as we've had, as we've had available to us um, to the school-based mental health program. And I want to continue to do that. Uh, I, wanna, I don't want to be redundant, but uh, is it enough? Absolutely not. Uh, there's more money that's needed. And I think you're going to have an advocate with uh, Christina Henderson and uh, hopefully with the other new members who come on uh, to the council uh, as well. We don't know uh, what will come over. The budget will come over to the council in uh, I guess another six, eight weeks uh, and we'll start the process then of determining uh, how much more do we need to be able to accomplish what you've set out to do and what we've set out to do. And uh, I hope that you all, I know you will, because I know, I know the uh, organization very well. Uh, I hope that you all will work with us to identify what the additional needs are and work with us to be able to avoid the kinds of uh, situations that uh, Randy uh, just talked about. And that is a child who gets beaten uh, going home uh, from school. Uh, it's just ludicrous for children to be put in those kinds of situations. And it's, even yes, and it's even more concerning that we don't have services that supports them when they're in those uh, positions. You yeah. know, out of pocket, it's $200 per session uh, for psychologists. If you don't have Medicaid, you don't even get to be on a, uh, a wait list. So having those services in schools are crucial. We should literally have a social worker at every school. There needs to be funding that allows that to make that happen. And so I'm asking you, uh, Mr. Gray, how do we make that happen? Well, I think by doing what you do already, and that is advocating, um, advocating strongly uh, who, for the kinds of services that you want to take the school-based mental health plan uh, that we put in place, uh, working with uh, Dr. Bazron, who's now the uh, director of the Department of Behavioral Health. And frankly, um, we worked hard to replace the then uh, director of the Department of Behavioral Health. Uh, so you're saying that the urgency that I'm expressing is also your urgency because of course it is. Of we're course dealing it is. with going back to school, right? So we're, we're yes. trying to figure out how to be in person. That's going to have an impact on our students, right? They'll have a fear about whether they're going to be safe or not. Um, what's happening with their parents when they're not there. So we definitely need to be putting this front on the table. We got to beat this up, Greg. Right? Come on now. You know, you, you, you put policies in place and programs that work. How are we going to bring those back up front so that it's understood that we need funding in that area now? Not, okay. not as soon, not as we, you know, work, work on it, but now, immediately. I understand. I understand it well. I've understood it long before now. I don't know if you know my background. I'm, oh, I do. I'm very familiar with you. And I, okay. I, and I, are you, and are I'm you aware, so are you aware that, that you were here about? to come to this meeting for me to speak to? Because I know if anybody could get it done, Mr. Gray can get it done. <laughs> so I'm counting on you. I'm counting on you. And, and I'm going to work hard uh, to try to get it done, just as I did before when I came back to the council. I wanted to work on the school-based mental health program. I wanted to work on health care. That's why I chair the health committee, uh, to be able to work on issues just like we're talking about uh, now. 
And frankly, I'm going to have to rely upon PAVE and the other parents to be able to work with us to continue to make the case for how important the investment of these resources, uh, how important that is. And I have no reservations about making the case. Uh, I will. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, the trauma brain can't learn. And so all educational efforts will, you know, go by the wayside if we're not dealing with mental health and how it impacts our, our children's ability to learn. We got to get that at the top. Um, Amen. I agree. I agree with you. And, uh, but, but it's going to take you all to help make the case. Of course. That's why I'm that's here. And, and that's why I'm here today. There you go. I, I've always, I've never missed a paid meeting. Uh, ask, ask folks who've been with PAVE in the past. Oh, I, I believe that. Meeting, have not missed a meeting and won't miss any meetings. And I will be reaching out to you all to say, hey guys, come on, this is what we need. And I'm counting on you to do that. I'm gonna hold and, and I'm counting on you all to do that too. Oh, I always, you know, PAVE is always here from what I hear. This is my first year in experience. Mental health yeah. has, um, you know, unfortunately um, taken the front seat in my house and so, I, I, I made that commitment to be part of the voice. So I'm joining you, Mr. Gray, but I'm counting on you uh, getting this on the table. And, I'm, and I'm, I'm gonna continue to keep it on the table. It's always been on the table. We've added money in the past and I will keep it on the table and we'll work as hard as we can uh, to get the resources that are, that are needed to adequately fund this program. Yes, we need it on the table now. We need that $4 million, Mr. Gray. Come on now. I, I hear you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Randy, for that powerful and personal story. You, um, I feel like you're just like you're rocking it. <laughs> you are absolutely rocking it right now. Um, Council Member Gray, I do want to ask um, if it would be possible um, for you to extend your time um, past 12 o'clock. We have um, a couple more um, very important questions that we want to be able to get to today. Go right ahead. Awesome. Thank you so, so, so okay. much. Um, so our next question uh, comes from, oh, sorry about that. Um, so our next question um, comes from Kamara Francis, who is also, again, a Ward 7 parent leader. Um, her children go to Mundo Verde, um, and she's going to be asking a question about dual language programs. Okay. Good morning, Councilman Gray. Um, Good morning. As Sharon How are you? Stayed, I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing Okay. Um, as Sharon stated, I am a Ward 7 resident. I'm a mother of a kindergartner, and I'm also a bilingual advocate and a founder of a nonprofit organization, East of the River Foreign Languages for Kids. Um, and as she stated, my son um, attends uh, Mundo Verde, which is a dual language school. Um, and as you know, um, currently families all across DC are waitlisted, trying to gain admit admittance into dual language schools. Um, we know that there are proven benefits to mastering a second language, and it's directly correlated with standardized test scores. Um, on average, students enrolled in dual language programs outperform their monolingual peers on standardized assessments. The data substantiates that dual language programs can help narrow the achieve achievement gap. Um, there are also cognitive benefits that we know of, um, increased mental flexibility, decision-making and problem solving among bi bilinguals. Um, and also uh, mastering a second language translates to increased opportunities for higher education, as well as the ability to obtain higher paying jobs in the marketplace, both locally and internationally. Um, as of school year 2020, there are 23 uh, public dual language immersion programs in DC, but only three are located east of the river. Two are charters and the other is Houston Elementary School. Um, and so my question to you today is how will you ensure equitable access and full funding for dual language education for students living in wards seven and eight? Well, you're absolutely right about the benefits uh, that accrue uh, to our young people and to their families. Uh, with uh, dual language uh, programs. Uh, I've worked with some of the, the charters that have dual language programs. Um, in fact, I was, when, when I was mayor, I was uh, a, uh, I, went, I went to China uh, for a uh, program uh, and I went to uh, the dual language program uh, that was a, a charter school on, um, on Taylor Street which I think is now moved, uh, it's still operational, it, it moved. Uh, and uh, I, rec I recognize the benefits uh, that our children get uh, from having 
the ability to speak another language other than English, of course. Uh, and the kids did a great job with me, helping me uh, as, be as equipped as I could uh, going to China uh, to be able to go to Beijing and speak uh, as best I could uh, at that stage uh, in another language other than uh, English. So um, I, I understand the benefits uh, of uh, dual language programs, of multi-language uh, programs. And I will work as hard as I can to try to make sure that dual language programs are continuing to be a part of the educational opportunities for our young people. Um, and I would love to see our parents be able to get increasingly exposed to the dual language opportunities as well. Um, when, I, when I went to uh, the, the program I just talked about, um, there were parents who actually were able to speak a Mandarin. And um, it, was, it was a wonderful experience for them. And it was a wonderful uh, experience for me. And we need to keep doing that. Uh, yes, it's going to take money. Uh, will, it, will it require more than what we probably have? May well be. But we need to keep making the case for <clears throat> why additional resources are needed uh, to be able to serve uh, these young people in dual language programs. And, and as I stated before, you know, we, I think, typically have looked at dual language programs as a novelty. And I think um, what we're seeing now with studies, um, proven studies from, we have years of data now, um, that this is also closing the achievement gap. And I think it's important when we look at the numbers of dual language programs, 23, that's outside of East of the River and three east of the river. I mean, um, in east of the river, I think Ward 7 and Ward 8 has the, um, the, the is the wars with the youngest uh, students, you know. So when you think about that um, and all the opportunities that, that are potentially lost um, because of, of lack of access, I think it's important to like really look at this as um, as a tool that can really help our children and propel them um, in all facets of life. I mean, if you look at any job announcement nowadays, I mean, having the ability to be bilingual is sometimes mandatory um, or preferred. Um, and so these are the positions that they're going to be applying for. You know, these are, um, and so we wanna position them. We wanna make sure that they are prepared to really function in a global, not just function, but thrive in a global, um, in a globalized world, you know? So um, I think, you know, I, also not, you know, look your view as to whether this is, you know, something that's extracurricular or this is something that you see as an important part of developing brain, developing cognitive abilities, developing, um, you know, necessary skills. Like, you know, I want to know that too. Like, how do you view it? Um, do you feel like it's just as important as science and math and everything else? Well, you, you said it already, that we live in a global world and that, that's gonna be increasingly uh, important to be able to uh, speak the languages that uh, our children are being exposed to uh, every day. So um, I, I understand perfectly and accept fully the importance of being able to make these opportunities available uh, to our children. And without us you know, taking the leadership and you know, being supportive of this, uh, our children are going to be left behind. Uh, so many jobs uh, at this stage are increasingly going to people who have the capacity to uh, speak one or another uh, additional uh, language. Uh, I go back to my, my statement about uh, going to China and uh, being able to have some capacity to be able to speak Mandarin uh, when I went to when I went when I went, went on that trip. That's just the beginning. Um, you know, we've got uh, so many uh, nations now that our children will be able to get jobs in and they need to have the capacity to speak those languages. And that's up to us to make that happen. Thank you. Thank you so much for your question, Kamara, um, and for your response, Councilmember Gray. I think mm -hmm. that um, one of the other points, just like Kamara said, is that um, you know, with Ward Seven and Eight having um, some of the youngest children in the district, this would be a perfect opportunity to um, infuse this um, dual language programming into the Birth to Three movement as well, because sure. um, that is the perfect time for children to learn um, a new language and to learn new things. So we certainly hope that we can count on your continued support for that. Um, well, you, you certainly can count on my support for 
helping people understand why the investment in our children being able to have you know, capacity to speak more than one language uh, is important. And you certainly can count on me to try to help make the case because that's the future. That's where the jobs are ultimately uh, for our young people. And uh, so many of our young people will ultimately have jobs uh, you know, in other nations and be able, will need to speak the language uh, of those nations. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, and we certainly, um, again, are thankful for your commitment to stay um, past 12 so that we can get to all of our questions. Um, we have um, one more prepared question, and then we have several questions in the chat that we want to get to as well. Uh, and so our next um, prepared question um, comes from um, one of our uh, other Board 7 PLE board members, um, uh, Elizabeth Reddick, who is a um, parent of children at Bridges PCS and Dunbar High School. Um, and she'll be asking a question about transportation and what's on everybody's minds these days, school reopening. Yep. By the way, I'm a graduate of Dunbar High School, public school graduate. <laughs> Thank you um, for meeting with us today, Council Member Gray. Um, so I'll just get started uh, real quick. Um, I'm of course a Ward 7 resident and although I'm not a DC native, I have always considered DC to be my home and I'm now raising my children here. I began spending summers in the late nineties with my uncle who lived on Florida Avenue. I remember being locked inside because he would say you're safer in here than out there. When I joined the military in 2005 at 19 years old, I made DC my home of record because I always intended to come back. Since then, I've had two sons here, one in 2012 and one in 2018. You may ask why that matters, but you see in uh, 2012, DC hit a record low of just 88 homicides. You were um, the mayor, Kathy Lanier was the mayor, police chief, right. and Kevin Donahue was the deputy mayor of public safety. In 2018, when I returned after my divorce, um, I remained a re ever since then I've remained a resident of Ward 7, but I came back expecting the same changes that I saw in 2012. I wasn't aware that there was a real problem in the city until April 11, 2019, when my 13 year old daughter witnessed a shooting near Anacostia uh, Neighborhood Library on her way home from school. Let's face it, whether it's COVID-19 or gun violence, Ward 7 and 8 continually to be, continue to be historically and most deeply impacted by public health concerns. I am here today driven by solutions. I offer a call for partnership as it relates to a safe and equitable, equitable, equitable sorry, plan mm -hmm. for school reopening in DC. As a part of our plan, we believe that the system and LEA leaders should work with uh, WMATA and other necessary partners to create guidance for safe transportation for students, especially those that take the bus or metro. Um, I, as a parent, I know what my child needs to feel safe um, to return to school. And of course, we are all, all parents are experts in what their children's needs. We are here, council member, ready to partner with you and to share that responsibility and expertise in building a safe and equitable plan for school reopening. You have mentioned, um, you know, throughout our session here um, about continuing our current advocacy measures by reaching out to your various colleagues and other uh, key decision makers. But do you have a concrete example on how parents can effectively advocate in the most impactful way? Yes, Pave. <laughs> to me, to me, Pave is a shining example of uh, how parents have um, taken the leadership and you know, know the issues very well, you know, in a substantial part because of their children uh, being involved in the educational programs in our, uh, in our public schools. And by public schools, I mean the DCPS as well as our charter schools. And of course we've got, uh, I know we've got uh, you know, parents who are involved with some of the parochial schools uh, in the District of Columbia uh, as well. So I think the work that PAVE does is a shining example of how um, parent advocacy can be effective. Uh, know the issues, uh, don't be shy about uh, articulating the uh, issues and uh, do, what, do what you have to do to make sure that my colleagues uh, hear uh, the issues as well as you do, okay? So, um, and I will, I, I will be happy to continue to be what I've done before, 
And I've worked with Maya and so many parents uh, before and will continue to do that. And that is to try to be as effective as I can in communicating um, how that information needs to be transmitted, uh, conveyed uh, to uh, folks who are policymakers. And there, there, are, there are a lot of very caring people uh, who are involved with helping to get our educational programs effectively funded. And uh, I would just ask that, uh, that you all continue to do what you've done in the past. Uh, PAVE has been a great organization for being able to articulate exactly what is needed uh, to get to the next place. Uh, you've been supportive of uh, our school-based mental health programs uh, in the past. You've been supportive of some of the things that I've advocated for, like uh, birth to three, uh, getting our children started at the very earliest point. So please continue to do that. And I will continue to do it. And working together, hopefully we will have an opportunity to be able to, uh, to, to, to be victorious, to get to the next place. Uh Thank you for those comments, Council Member Gray. Um, and I know that um, another part of um, Elizabeth's question was centered around school reopening. And yeah. um, exactly, um, there are a lot of teachers, a lot of students, um, a lot of families who are um, very unsure about how safe it is to return to school. And so um, uh, one of the questions or part of that question is, um, what can we do? Um, what, what will you do to help to ensure that there's more parent voice um, in these reopening plans? Um, um, and um, just kind of like, what is your position on that? Well, uh, I, the, the voices that have, have the parents continue to be uh, a voice. Um, I, I feel very strongly that, um, you know, we need to continue to articulate how important it is to get the vaccine uh, out to folks. You know, we hear discussion uh, taking place all over the country about the vaccine, the, the, the number of doses of vaccine uh, have been inadequate. Uh, given the need uh, that exists. And so um, we are, by the way, I want to mention this, and I hope some of you will come out and testify. I'm having a hearing uh, this Friday, uh, and the purpose is for folks who are, um, who, who, who really haven't had a chance to get the vaccine, get the, the, the doses uh, that they need, will come out and talk about the challenges, the frustrations that they've experienced and help us understand uh, what those problems are and, and then articulating them to, uh, to the uh, mayor's administration. Um, I will then have a hearing on Monday uh, in which we will bring in the administration. I'm gonna make sure that those voices are given the opportunity to be heard uh, as a result of the hearing on Friday and uh, would ask PAVE parents uh, to participate uh, come, come, come in and participate on Friday and be a part uh, of that voice as PAVE has always done in terms of being able to articulate what the needs of our children uh, are. Uh, I want to see our schools uh, reopened. I want to see our schools be as safe as they possibly can. And of course, we want to see our teachers be as safe as they possibly can in going back uh, to school. Uh, I am an advocate for reopening our schools reopening them as safely as we possibly can and uh, make sure that we give our children a chance to continue to be educated as we know they can be uh, educated effectively uh, with, um, you know, with other children and with, uh, with other families uh, working with them. Certainly appreciate um, you sharing that information about the um, hearing on Friday, um, because I do know um, as an educator, there have been um, some sincere challenges with uh, getting the vaccines. There was a line down the street um, around Dunbar yesterday um, with teachers who had appointments trying to get the vaccine. So um, we certainly appreciate that information about the, um, the hearing on Friday. Um, and so um, with that, I certainly appreciate your time with the prepared questions that we had. And so I'm going to pass it over now um, to carry um, to facilitate the questions in the chat. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. Appreciate it. Um, Council Member Gray, our, our first question um, from the chat is from uh, Award 7 parent Lakeisha Lloyd, um, and she has some questions, uh, some more specific questions about the school reopening plan um, that you just touched on a little bit earlier. 
um, but she wanted to know about schools having the proper um, PPE that's needed, if there are enough teachers um, for both virtual and in-person learning, um, and what the picture looks like for school budgets, um, particularly as we're sort of um, figuring out what the citywide plan for reopening in person um, will look like. Well, um, we, 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 we obviously want the schools to reopen uh, as safely uh, as they possibly uh, can and to have PPE and have the other uh, needs met uh, that our teachers as well as the students uh, will require uh, as they go back uh, to school. Uh, I have visited the schools. I'm going to continue uh, to visit schools as much as I possibly can. And um, if, as pay recognizes some of these needs, uh, there are particular schools you think I should go and visit, uh, I would appreciate uh, you letting me know, and I will do that. Thank you, Council Member. Um, our, our next question um, is from another Ward 7 parent, uh, Yolanda Corbett, um, and she's looking to know um, more about the uh, Minor Consent for Vaccinations Act. Um, and just wondering if you could share a little bit more about the goal of the bill and the process to getting it to its current form. Well, the, the bill was introduced by uh, Council Member Mary Che, and uh, she was a very vocal advocate uh, for the bill. Um, People got hung up on the issue of 11 years old. It wasn't necessarily 11 years old. It was being able to have informed consent. And that is, is, is and, and a physician would be the one, because uh, we, got, we got not only the, uh, you know, we, we had not only uh, parents involved to testify, but we had uh, physicians uh, who testified, who talked about what it, what, involved, what it involves to have informed consent. And that means to be able to speak, um, you know, as fully and knowledgeable, knowledgeably about what the issues are. And a physician would have to make that decision of whether the child at that stage has enough knowledge and information about the issues that are in front of them to be able to make uh, a decision. So I don't, I don't want people to get hung up on 11 years old. It was just used as an illustration. Uh, the issue is whether a physician then uh, will make a determination that this particular person has the wherewithal to answer uh, the question knowledgeably um, on information associated with that issue. Thank you, Councilmember Gray. Um, our next question uh, is from Jamie Hall, um, another Ward 7 parent. Um, and she shared that her seven-year-old um, is uh, experiencing separation anxiety that's getting worse um, because of the pandemic. And right now she is uh, prefers virtual learning. Um, and so wants to know about your plan to support students and parents that at this time do not feel safe uh, returning to school. Well, uh, you know, I've indicated that I, I, I am not a huge fan of virtual learning as an option. Uh, I mean, it's an option for, you know, we, we ought to be able to work with parents. Um, if there are good reasons why, um, you know, having children not going back to school, if, if the case can be made. Um, I happen to be one of those who would love to see all of our children back in school and our very youngest children, especially because so much of our evidence uh, points to the fact that when children uh, have a chance to go to school and be around other children, they benefit uh, mightily uh, from that. Um, the social experiences, the emotional experiences of being uh, in the same environment uh, with other children are huge. Uh, and we obviously not gonna put children at risk uh, for them to be able to go to school, let's put it that way. Um, in the course of so doing, we need to make sure that we have, uh, you know, we have done the job that we need to do to make sure that the school environments are safe, uh, to make sure that our teachers are safe uh, as they go to school. And, you know, if, if for some, uh, virtual learning is the best way to be able to, uh, <clears throat> to educate our children, we, we certainly have the opportunity to be able to make that available uh, to our uh, students. Uh, I, I don't want to see children put in harm's way by any stretch of the imagination. And I certainly want to hear from PAVE and other parents uh, about what does it mean uh, to be able to have a child 
going into a classroom? Uh, what does it mean to have a child uh, involved in virtual learning? Um, I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how much, uh, what, what, the, what the gains or losses will be for so many of our children uh, who have been involved, <clears throat> involved in virtual learning and uh, those who are now going back to, to school. Uh, again, I'm a proponent of getting our children safely back into schools, have them have the opportunity to have the emotional and social experiences of uh, others, because uh, we know they benefit from that. But if there's some reason, if there's a good argument to be made uh, for not having a child back uh, in school, we need to listen to those, those arguments and we need to be responsive to them. Thank you, council member. Uh, our next question is from Hazel Romero, um, from also from Award 7 Parent Leader. Um, and she has a couple questions around um, health insurance. Um, as the chair of the health committee, um, do you have a plan that includes people who don't have health insurance? Um, and how will the committee help them uh, get access to the vaccine? An additional um, related question is um, supporting to change the alliance renewal um, process uh, to one time a year instead of every six months um, in order to reduce that barrier for families. Can I answer that one first? I have sure. very hard on the legislation uh, associated with that. And on an emergency basis, we just got the money and the approval uh, of the council uh, to be able to address the issue of um, our our families not having to go uh, get you know to to, to, get, to go <clears throat> excuse me uh, to go uh, you know early earlier let's put it that way uh, so that they they can be addressed now more quickly uh, than they otherwise uh, would be addressed that was a legislation that we just got passed just a few weeks ago. Uh, it was an emergency bill that I uh, that I joined with uh, Council Member Nadeau, uh, who's the Ward One Council Member, and also is on the Health Committee. We worked together to make that happen. We got a unanimous vote um, that now um, reduces those timetables, uh, so that parents and families do not have to go with the same frequency that they had to go to before. Now that bill will come up, I'm sure, on a permanent basis uh, during the next. Uh, when the budget comes down. And uh, I want to ask uh, PAVE to please be there and work with us advocating for those uh, efforts <clears throat> that we've gotten improved now on an emergency basis. So yes, uh, I am happy to have done that and I'm happy to continue to, to wage uh, that fight. I think there was another part to the question uh, and I'll, if you can go back to that, I'd appreciate it. Sorry, right, apologies. Um, tech challenges per usual for me. Um, but so uh, Yazelle's other part of the question was just around um, supporting uh, those who don't have health insurance um, and yeah. getting them access to the vaccine. Well, I guess my first question would be, why is it that the person doesn't have health insurance? Um, Obamacare has opened the door to health insurance for virtually everybody. Uh, you know, Medicaid and other forms of commercial insurance uh, that are available to people. Um, so I would want to be able to know why the person doesn't have health insurance in the first place. And we will work with uh, the families to try to make sure you do get health insurance. There's no reason why you shouldn't be eligible for health, health insurance. That's why we fought the battle, <clears throat> excuse me, on, uh, on getting people the, the recertification uh, to get people out of that. But they don't have to go through that process uh, now uh, as they've been through it before. So one, uh, if somebody doesn't have health insurance, I'd want to know why. My staff and I will be happy to work with, uh, with the families that are in that dilemma and see if we can, I'm sure we can find a way uh, to help get health insurance for those who don't have it uh, at this stage. And if they don't, uh, we should know why. It, it, it just, it doesn't add up to me that somebody doesn't have health insurance uh, because of other than choice. There should be reasons why, that I don't think there's a good reason why we can't get the health insurance uh, for uh, persons. And if they don't, we'll work with you to try to help get it done. Great, thank you, council member. Um, 
Our next question, there's a, been a couple of questions in the chat from a few parent leaders that I'll just try to group together, um, largely asking about crime and violence in Ward 7. So this um, was raised by Lakeisha Lloyd, a Ward 7 parent from uh, Simone Scott and, and a few others. Um, but they're looking to hear from you about your plan to combat that increased violence, um, particularly amongst the youth in the ward, um, seeing how the, the unprecedented um, negative effects in their community Community, the implications on mental health um, and feeling safe to go back to school. Um, just looking to get your uh, thoughts and plans to address that issue. Well, it's, it's an enormous issue and uh, it's a doggone shame um, that we have our children. We heard, I guess it was Randy was talking about what her, you know, her child had been subjected to getting off of the bus, you know, trying to go home. Um, we, we, we need more uh, we need more work uh, supporting uh, these children, uh, supporting the parents uh, of these children, parents like Randy, uh, who, uh, you know, wants to see their child be able to use public transportation and to be able to have them get off of public transportation or get on it in the first place and uh, do that safely. And um, I, I would love to work with PAVE around ideas uh, that you all may have uh, to be able to effectuate that. Uh, PAVE has been good at doing these kinds of things uh, in the past. And um, I hope that you would continue to be able to do that uh, in the future. Um, there are no easy answers uh, to this. Uh, you know, we, bullying is still, a, um, is still unfortunately an experience that so too many of our children uh, experience. And we have people who are bullies, and then we have children who are bullied, uh, which is, we have, a, we have a bullying policy, and uh, we've asked all of our uh, educators uh, and the folks who work in our schools uh, to be able to be fully aware of the policy. Uh, I will make sure that uh, the parents who don't have the policy uh, get a copy of it. We actually crafted the policy uh, when I was mayor, and uh, we worked hard uh, to get it, um, you know, fully implemented. Do we still have children who are bullied? Do we still have children who are bullies? Absolutely. Uh, and I wish we didn't, but it's up to pay working with us and others to be able to make sure that that case is made and to, to call attention, uh, to children who engage in that kind of behavior, which is completely inappropriate. Thank you, council member. Um, our next question is from Brittany Wade, um, a Ward 7 parent uh, who asked um, about a lot of the schools in Ward 7, um, or I should say she noted that a lot of the schools in Ward 7 haven't been updated um, and that there were health problems that, uh, for children that were coming out uh, from the, from the facilities even before the pandemic. Um, and so her question is, how are, what's your plan um, to get them ready uh, for families as we look to, to update the facilities as we look to return in person? Well, you know, as, as mayor, as the uh, chair of the council, when I was chair of the council, and now as a council member, I continue to look at the condition uh, of our schools and I'm prepared to do as much as we can, as quickly as we can uh, to be able to get um, the uh, schools to a point where we where we feel comfortable with the condition uh, of those schools. We have built a number of schools uh, on the east end of the city, uh, Ward 7, Ward 8. Um, I, was, I was the one who, as the mayor, uh, rebuilt Woodson High School. Uh, we, we tower power. Uh, and uh, we rebuilt the school. It is a beautiful uh, school. Uh, I've rebuilt a number of schools uh, in the city uh, as mayor, as, you know, as a council member. Etc. We want to continue to do that. And where there are physical problems associated with a school, um, I would ask that um, I would ask that the uh, families let us know what they are observing, and we will try to address those issues as quickly as we possibly can, uh, and as effectively as we possibly can. Um, there's no question, and, and parents should uh, be working hard try to make sure that their schools are in the best condition uh, possible. Um, we've rerouted money uh, from other programs to be able to uh, address uh, the physical condition uh, of some of our schools. We put new windows in schools, we put new roofs uh, on schools, and we, we will continue, we need to continue to do that 
And I'm committed to continuing to do that. And we just need to know that as it happens. But as, people, as parents discover problems um, with the physical condition uh, of these buildings, we need to know as soon as that is discovered so that we can impart that information to uh, the Department of General Services, uh, who I work very closely with, and um, others uh, in the city who have a role in helping to address those problems. Great, thank you, Council Member. We have lots of engaged folks on the call who, who I'm sure will follow up on that, uh, as well as, <laughs> as some of those other issues that we touched on before. Um, so I have, I have just a couple more questions for you and appreciate you um, extending the time so we can still have the full hour's worth of questions. Um, this next one is from Sharon Culver, our, our meeting chair today. Um, and Sharon asked uh, or noted that it would be great to return to school in person, um, but because that's not the preference uh, for all families and or teachers, um, wants to know what can be done to urge DCPS and the council to put more into making virtual learning as a effective as it can be. So I know this is something you touched on before, um, but just looking to, Sharon noted that um, teachers haven't been effectively trained or provided the resources to teach children virtually and want to see your plan to address that. Well, again, I, I, I won't say I'm not a fan of virtual learning uh, because it is, for some children, it is quite effective. But I think in-person uh, learning uh, is maybe the most effective way uh, to do that. Um, I've, 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 I've participated in hearings. Uh, we had one with the chancellor uh, just um, about a week ago uh, in which you know, he had a chance to talk about how he's going to continue to provide training uh, to our teachers and opportunities for our teachers to continue to become increasingly, increasingly effective um, at uh, virtual learning. So. Um, we will continue with the, uh, the uh, training uh, that's available to our teachers. Um, and we will work, of course, with the Washington Teachers Union as much as we can to help them be as effective as they possibly can uh, also. So, and Sharon, thank you so much. I appreciate all the work that you do and your husband. I know him very well. He's an advisory neighborhood commissioner, commissioner and very active. And I appreciate you all continuing to be, continuing to be active parents. Thank you. Thanks, Council Member. Um, and I have uh, another question for you from Renee Davis, um, who is a, a Ward 1 parent leader. Um, and Renee shared that she is a war, um, Ward 1 PAVE PLE board member who is a neurodiverse mom of two autistic youth. Alexa is age 16 and has a private placement at the Children's Guild in Maryland um, with IEP support from the Capital City Public Charter School. Um, she also has a 12 year old Michael who is an inclusion sixth grade in an inclusion sixth grade setting with ISP support um, also from Capital City. Um, but due to their dual diagnosis, the, the autism spectrum uh, and mental illness COVID has required more home-based services as provided through Medicaid. Um, and she notes that if this had been you know, a normal day, Alexa would have interacted uh, with more than seven people um, to support her, including a medical nurse at home, um, someone, a dedicated aide on the bus, um, an aide in the school classroom, her teachers, her job coach, school psychologist, the nurse. Um, but now those those needs are being met through the health services for children with need uh, for children with needs, um, which is a Medicaid benefit. Um, but has been provided home health nursing and behavioral based therapy in her home. Um, so how can we work with you as you create plans to support students with disabilities while they're at home, including increasing access to medical professionals and services um, and making sure that this is done uh, through DBH and clearly communicated uh, to families so that all folks have access to those services. So that's a great question. And uh, for those who know anything about my background, I've spent a lot of my life uh, working with uh, children and adults, for that matter, uh, with disabilities, <clears throat> recognizing that, uh, you know, the disabilities that uh, you, you were just talking about the, from the questioner, um, the, the, we need to do more, do more to make sure that we have inclusion opportunities for our children uh, with disabilities. Our children uh, benefit emotionally and socially from the chance to be with other people uh, who may have, they may be, they may have differences themselves. And being around other children with, with disabilities or differences, 
I think is a great benefit uh, to our children. Um, I've worked very closely with um, Wayne Turnage, uh, who is the deputy mayor now for, um, uh, for uh, health, health and mental health, health and social services, human services, mental health and human services. I've worked very closely with him. I know he's a strong proponent of uh, having children to be in environments uh, where they get the exposure uh, to um, others who may uh, may not have the same uh, physical or uh, physical challenges um, as some of our children do. But our children benefit from that. And so I'm going to continue to make sure that the benefits of Medicaid are available uh, to our children. Uh, we, I work very closely with, uh, we'll have a hearing coming up with her in just a few weeks, uh, Dr. Bazron, uh, who is the director of uh, behavioral health uh, for the city. And uh, I will continue to make sure, in fact, I would hope that whoever the questioner was will be there to testify at the uh, hearing when we have it in just a few weeks. And you can get the information about the time, the date and so forth uh, from our office. Uh, with our health committee. Uh, Eric Goulet is our uh, committee director, and uh, I know his sensitivity uh, to these issues, and um, I don't have any doubt that he will be as forthcoming as he possibly can, make sure that information is available uh, to those who want to testify at those hearings. Great. Thank you, Council Member. I saw you got a, a thumbs up from Renee, uh, who asked that question about testifying. So um, I look forward for you to hear more from her there. Um, but so I know we are, are pretty close to time, and I'm going to hand the mic back to Sharon in just one second. Um, but as you know, it would not be a paved meeting if we didn't take a picture of all of us in our purple shirts. Um, and you'll have a <laughs> Uh, coming your way, council member. It'll be a little different this year. Instead of the yellow scarf, you'll have a. Yeah, I usually have my scarf too. <laughs> right. yeah, it'll just be a little delayed this year. Um, but so, if everyone could, if you're able to just turn your cameras on so we can see your beautiful faces. We have so many folks on the call today. We want to make sure we capture all of you. Um, but I'll turn it over to you, Morgan, to, to snap the pic. All right, you guys, two pages to go through. I'll start with page one with a countdown. Three, two, one, smile. And page number two. Three, two, one, smile. All right, thanks so much. Back to you, Carrie. Thanks, thanks so much, guys. I appreciate it. I always enjoy these paved meetings. I never leave feeling unchallenged, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Council Member. Before you take off, I, I do just want to uh, pass the mic back to Sharon, uh, who will close us out. Thank you so much, Council Member Gray, um, for meeting with us today um, and sharing um, your thoughts and perspectives on um, what it is that you'll do um, to help support us in these efforts. Um, we certainly look forward to working with you um, towards equitable funding um, for our schools um, and communities um, for mental based um, mental health um, school based supports um, and for um, parent pre representation at the decision making table around a safe and equitable um, reopening of our schools. Um, or virtual learning, should that be the option that our parents decide. Um, for all of our parents on the call, of course, um, it would not be a paid event if we did not have an exit ticket. So you should have received a text message for that and they'll probably post it um, in the chat as well. Um, and with that, I will kick it back to Carrie. Karen, would you please tell your husband I said hello? I absolutely will, yes, sir. Thank you. And tell him, by the way, as a piece of legislation that uh, I worked closely with him on that we're getting ready to reintroduce on Juneteenth. So tell him that we're getting ready to reintroduce that now. Yes, sir. Thank you. Great. Um, well, I, I will just echo um, Sharon's sentiment, Council Member. Really appreciate your time um, and willingness to, to engage with us today and share the information about uh, uh, additional upcoming opportunities for parents to, to advocate for their priorities and, and get things done that we need, that we know we need for our kids. Um, so we'll say bye to you now, but uh, it's a not a goodbye forever, but see you later. You'll hear from us soon. Um, and thank you again to you and your team for joining us. And uh, uh, for those parents on the call, if you just want to stay uh, to fill out your exit tickets, but otherwise that's a wrap for this one. Thank you. <laughs>